Let's walk through the life cycle of the live view for our light. When we browse to the light page, that sends a regular HTTP GET request to the server. And we have a live route declared in the router for that. Then in our light live module, the mount callback is invoked, which assigns the initial state to the socket. And as you recall, it's a brightness of 10. Then render is automatically invoked with the state that mount assigned to the socket. Then a full HTML page is sent back to the client as a regular HTTP response. Handling the initial request this way has a few important benefits. First, the response is super quick. Second, even if JavaScript is disabled in the browser, you get a complete, fully rendered, meaningful HTML page, not just a shell of a page. And this also means a live view page is search engine friendly. Nothing too surprising so far, but here's where things get interesting. When the initial page is loaded, it also loads JavaScript, it's in app.js, which turns around and opens a persistent WebSocket connection to the server. It's at this point that a stateful live view process is spawned. Mount is then invoked again, this time inside of the stateful process, and initializes the state of that process by assigning values to the socket. Then, as you probably already guessed, render is also invoked again to render a new view for that state. And the new view is pushed back to the browser over the WebSocket. But what gets sent back isn't a string of HTML as you might expect. It's actually something a bit more intriguing. Let's zoom in and focus on this section of our Live View template. Since brightness is interpolated in two EEX tags in this template, we have two dynamic values, values that may or may not change. The rest of the template is static. It will never change. Live View splits this template into two parts, the stuff that's dynamic and the stuff that's static. Both of the dynamic values evaluate to 10, since that's the initial brightness. You can think of this value as being at position or index 0 of the template, and this value in position or index 1, and both parts are sent to the client. Then the JavaScript provided by the LiveView library weaves the static and dynamic parts together. Splitting the rendered content into static and dynamic parts really pays off when we start handling events. For example, when we click the button to turn the light on, an on event is pushed down the WebSocket to the LiveView process and gets handled by a matching handle event callback. A brightness of 100 is assigned to the socket, and whenever a live view state changes, the render function is automatically called. Since handling the on event only changed the brightness value, setting it to 100, only these EEX tags in the template need to be reevaluated. If our template had other EEX tags that interpolate other dynamic values, they would only be reevaluated if turning on the light changed them. That's pretty clever. It doesn't have to reevaluate the code in all the EEX tags in the template. It only has to reevaluate the code for things that changed. Now, if you're curious, this is made possible because LiveView templates get compiled to Elixir code. So, what does LiveView send to the browser this time? Well, it doesn't send the static part again. That's already cached in the browser. Only the new dynamic values and their indexes get sent over. So, as before, all the LiveView JavaScript needs to do is weave the static and dynamic parts together. And then it uses the Morph DOM library to efficiently patch the DOM to turn the light on. So what happens if we click the on button again? Well, an on event is pushed down the WebSocket, the handle event callback assigns a brightness of 100, and render is invoked. But the Live View template is smart. It tracks changes to the state, and it knows that the brightness value hasn't actually changed. It was 100 before, and it's 100 now. And since nothing changed, there's no need to send new dynamic values to the client. In other words, the template does diff tracking. And so the response has no static or dynamic values. Now, if we click the off button, an off event is sent and handled, which sets the brightness to zero and render is invoked. And since the live view template is tracking changes to state, it recognizes that brightness changed. So all it sends back to the client are those dynamic values that were modified. So that's what happens at a conceptual level. Now let's go back to our light and see exactly what data is on the wire throughout the life cycle. And we'll do that by opening DevTools. And then we're on the Network tab, and we've got All selected. And this is only going to show network traffic since DevTools was opened. So we'll reload the page as if we were browsing the slash light for the first time. So first, it sends a regular HTTP GET request to slash light. We see that right here. Then we know on the server, mount and render are called, and the full HTML page is sent back. And we see that in the Response tab. We've got the standard HTML stuff with some meta tags. This meta tag here is the CSRF token. Then we have the body down here. Then we have this div right here that wraps the entire live view. 
You notice it has an attribute data PHX main set to true and also data PHX session. And so this is the encoded session data. And then inside that div, we have a couple paragraphs here for displaying live flash messages. And you notice they're both empty right now. Hmm, we didn't write those. We'll have to see where those come from in a minute. Yeah, but if we scroll down, we see some familiar stuff down here. Front porch light, we've got our light meter. Yeah, this is the content that's rendered by our live view template. Yeah, got our four buttons. And then down here, everything gets closed off. Now, if we scroll up, we'll see that part of loading this page, it also pulled in this app.js. So let's have a look at that. It's under assets, JS, app.js. And you notice it uses socket from the Phoenix JavaScript library. It also uses this in progress library for showing a progress bar when users perform live actions. Then it imports live socket from the Phoenix live view JavaScript library. Then it grabs the CSRF token from the page. Then it initializes this live socket with the slash live endpoint, the socket, and then params, which includes the CSRF token. And this endpoint is slash live because if we look at our endpoint, endpoint.ex, right down here, it defines a WebSocket mount point for slash live and it's Phoenix Live View Socket. Okay, back to app.js. We've initialized the live socket. Then this just sets up event listeners for showing the progress bar when necessary. Then it just takes this live socket and calls connect. And at this point, we have a persistent WebSocket connection. Now, if we go back to the browser and scroll down over here, we see we have two WebSocket connections. One has a CSRF token and the other doesn't. And the one without the token is for live reloading and development. So the one we want has this token here. And you see that it's connected to the live socket endpoint. So now the client and server can send messages back and forth over this connection. And we can see those messages in the messages tab. Let's scroll up past these automatic heartbeat messages that keep the connection alive. And we'll see the very first message that was sent. It's this PHX join message in green. The green background indicates it's an outbound message. Yeah, and if we click on it, we can see it better in this lower pane. So the message is just this array of elements and they're broken out for us down here. The first one is a join ref, it's four. The second one is a message ref, it's also four, but don't worry about those two. The third one is a Phoenix channel topic. You see it's LV colon PHX dash, and then some unique identifier. And that's because each live view connects to a unique Phoenix channel. Then we have the actual event, it's PHX underscore join. And then we have the payload, which is a JavaScript object. And if we look down in there, you'll see it's got params with the CSRF token and also the session data. So the result of sending this message is the live view joins a Phoenix channel and a stateful live view process is spawned. Mount and render are called again, this time inside that process. Then the response, which is the new view, is pushed back. And it's in this incoming PHX reply message. Yeah, it's the second one. We'll click on it. So what's the response we got back? Well, it's in number four, which is a JavaScript object. We'll just drill down into it, into response. It's got our rendered key, zero, one, and two. And this stuff in two looks familiar from the animation. We have two dynamic values at position zero and one, both set to a value of 10, which is the initial brightness of the light. And then under this key S, we have the static part. Let's go ahead and close that up just so we have more room. And we'll close this up too. And here's something new. At the top level, we have two dynamic values, which are empty strings, zero and one here. And we have a corresponding static part for those down under this S key. Hmm, so where are these coming from? Well, our live view is rendered within a couple layout templates. So let's go have a look at those. The layout templates are in the Live View Studio web directory under templates, layout. And you see that we have three layouts, app, live, and root. And all three of these were generated for us. Root is where everything gets started. So let's go ahead and pop that open. So it has all the standard HTML stuff, head, meta tags. This generates the CSRF token. This loads in the app.js. And then we've got the body. We've got an empty header tag. When this was generated, it had some navigational links in there, but we didn't want those cluttering up our live views, so we just removed them. Most important is this inner content right here. 
and it's going to be replaced by one of two other layout templates. So if it's not a live view, then this will get replaced by what's in the app layout template. It's the default application layout. But if it is a live view, then inner content is going to get replaced by what's in this live template here. Now you'll notice that the live layout and the root layout templates both have the extension L-E-E-X, which means these are live view templates in and of themselves. Yeah, that's right. So let's go ahead and pop open this live template. It has a main tag and then two paragraphs for displaying live flash messages, info and error. And since this is a live view template, both of these are dynamic values right here. This is in position zero and this is in position one. And since we don't have any flash messages for our live view page, they both evaluate to empty strings. And that's what we see over here. Zero is an empty string and one is an empty string. And then everything over here that's not in an EEX tag, well, that's just static stuff. And we see that over here under S. There's the main tag, paragraphs, and in the main tag. Then this inner content is replaced by what's in our live views render function. Yeah, that's under light live. And it returns an inline template. Right, and remember, it has two EEX tags to interpolate brightness, right there, and also right here. So both of those are dynamic values, and that's what we see over here. Click on two, it has zero and one, and they're both set to a value of 10. And then the rest of the template is just static stuff, and we see that here under S. So our H1, front porch light, all the way down to the end of the template. So because our live view template is nested inside layout templates, we see that nesting reflected here. Yeah, these dynamic and static parts are nested within the top level dynamic and static parts. And to bring this full circle, if we go back to this live layout template, you probably figured out that this inner content here is a dynamic value in position two. And we see that over here. Yeah, it's like those Russian nesting dolls placed one inside another. Love those things. Okay, so how does Live View weave all these dynamic and static parts together? Well, the static parts are just arrays of strings. So this one down here has four strings, zero, one, two, and three. And it got that by splitting this content in the layout template at each EEX tag. So here's string zero all the way up to the EEX tag. Here's string one up to the next EEX tag. Here's string two, it's just the ending paragraph, up to this EEX tag. And then here's string three. And we see that reflected over here. The main element starts, ending paragraph, ending paragraph, and then ending main. And the inline template in our render function over here in light live, well, it got split into strings in the same way. But in this case, there's just three strings, zero, one, and two here. So string zero is from here to right here when the EX tag starts. String one starts with this percent all the way down to here. String two picks up right here and goes all the way to the bottom of the template because we don't have any more EX tags. And we see that over here, string zero starts with H1, string one starts with a percent and string two starts with the other percent. Then it weaves all these parts together starting with the first static value here. This is the main. Then it goes to the first dynamic value at the top level. This this empty string zero. Then back down to static, this one right here. Then back up to dynamic, this empty string. Back down to static, it'd be this one. Then the next dynamic value is this set of dynamic and static values. So it starts here. Then it adds in the next dynamic value, 10. Back to static, back to dynamic, back to static. And then back to the final static, which ends main. Yeah, it's pretty cool how it zips the static and dynamic parts together. Yep, it just zips everything up. Okay, so now let's bump the brightness by 10. And if we scroll down past all the heartbeats, we see an up event is pushed down the web socket. Yep, the event is up right there. And that's handled by the handle event callback and the brightness is updated to 20. Then render is automatically called and a new view is pushed back and it's in this incoming PHX reply message. Right, and if we drill down into the response of it, well, it just includes two dynamic values. Zero is 20 and one is 20. So we just got the new dynamic values or the diffs. 
Yeah, there's no need to send the static part. It's already cached in the browser. These dynamic values are all that's needed to update the DOM. Let's go ahead and turn the light fully on now. We'll scroll down to find that event right here. Sent an on event. Check the reply. Dig down in here a little bit. Zero's 100 and one's 100. So again, we just got the diffs. Now LiveView has a built-in way to see some of the same information without having to dig down into the response. Yeah, if we come back over here to app.js at the very bottom, you see it takes this live socket instance and exposes it on the window. So now if we come back over to DevTools and click on console, we can take that live socket instance and call enable debug just like that. And that'll turn on debug logging. Now, when you enable debugging like this, a flag is dropped in the browser's session storage. So debugging stays enabled for the duration of the browser session. So let's reload the page with debugging enabled. We see join, and then we get just what's in the response. So dynamic values for the top level, here are its static parts, and then dynamic values for our inline live view template and its static parts. So now let's close this up. And if we bump the light up a bit, well, we get an update, look inside of here. Well, we see just the diffs. Now you can disable debugging by using disable debug, but having debugging enabled is pretty handy and we're gonna use it going forward. So we'll leave it in place. So up to this point, we've looked at what's happening on the client. Let's now go peek at what's happening on the server during the life cycle. Yeah, we can do that by adding some logging in the callbacks of our live view module, light live. And first in mount here, let's log the process ID that this function is invoked in. So we'll just use io.puts, we'll say mount, and then we'll inspect the process, which is just self. And then we'll do the same thing in render. Just change this to render. And we'll also put one of these down in handle event for the on event right here. And this will just be on. Then we'll open the Phoenix server log next to the browser and we'll put in a bunch of blank space to start with a clean slate. So now if we reload, we see in the log we get the initial get request to slash light. Then mount and render are invoked inside of the process 1124. And that sends back a full page of HTML. But then the browser opens a WebSocket connection, which we see happening right here. And we know at this point, a stateful live view process is spawned. Then mount and render are invoked again. And this time they're invoked inside of this stateful process with the ID 1144. So it's a different process. Then if we click on, an on event is pushed down the WebSocket and gets handled in the same stateful live view process, 1144. And then render is invoked in that same process. So hopefully that gives you a better and deeper understanding of the life cycle of a live view. Now let's go build another example.